how does your, when you were talking about the alien has latched on to us and is pulling with his tractor beam a long time ago, um, how do you relate your concept of the alien to world religion's concept of the creator or, um, you, you know, man's evo- karmic evolution to nirvana or samadhi? Well, I think what these religions are doing is that they are and they are interacting with this same intuition. The grandiosity comes in the sense that I don't think we're dealing with the God who hung the stars like lamps in heaven. You know what Milton said. Uh, that's some whole other scale. But what we're dealing with is something like the God of biology, that there is something on this planet that we have completely overlooked. I mean, look at the situation. We emerged from, you know, berry picking to photographing Europa in about uh, a million years. Well, life has been on this planet, higher animal life, I don't just mean algae and lichens and like that, I mean higher animal life has been running around on this planet for uh, 300 million years. Well, how many, you know, biology is an is a engine of strategies. How many peculiar byways of evolution might be pursued explored and then perhaps quenched on that kind of a time scale. So we assume the only kind of intelligence there can be is our kind. But then the psychedelic uh, introduces us and then we have a limited number of choices. After you fiddle with psilocybin for a while, the question of whether or not there is an alien intelligence becomes moot. There is an alien intelligence. And then the question is, what is it? And the choices as are, and maybe you can help me add more, the choices are, it is a straightforward B-movie extraterrestrial of some sort that is God knows for what reason, but coming at us through this. That's one possibility. Uh, it is the Gaian mind in some version of that. In other words, it's the integrated intelligence of the biome of the planet that because probably of the historical crisis is actually noticed us and is trying to twiddle our knobs in some dimension we're not even aware of. So that's it. Gai- extraterrestrial Gaian mind uh, could be some strange technological experiment launched from the future. In other words, since these things can communicate with us, since they seem to have some kind of value system related to our problems, maybe they are human beings of some sort. Uh, Perhaps it's a time travel project in some distant century that has decided that the key screw-up occurred in the 20th century and they're going back trying to twiddle the knob. (laughs) Notice that these theories have greater and lesser levels of elegance and I'm not (laughs) advocating any one. Here's one that I think is is interesting and mildly alarming. this is the shamanic one that these uh, are uh, that this entity, this contact, whatever it is, is somehow coming from the afterworld. That this is a project launched from an ecology of souls. That somehow uh, the erasure of the boundary between the living and the dead is what is at stake here. I mean, now this is from, you know, raised as logical positivists, this is the one you would choose last. I think it's much easier to believe in meddling extraterrestrials than that, you know, Uncle Herman and Aunt Fanny are somehow reaching in from the great beyond, yeah. Um, I've heard you say before, I'm almost certain I've heard you say before, that 
at, you can define the, the they, the alien, the creature, whatever, at particular levels or dosage of, um, of hallucinogen, hallucinogenic properties that at uh, five, precisely five measured grams of psilocybin, so lives, or there lives the pink elephant. You, you, I've heard you allude to the fact that not only for you is that a consistent dimension, but that for other uh, people that, that, that you compare notes with who do consistent levels, that there are dimensions that are measurable and that the, let's now call it alien, consistently show up there. Well, yeah, that's basically right. I mean, everybody views it through the filter of their own psychology, but everybody views this room through the filter of their own psychology. And it's not that, I mean, we assume that it's not that different for each of us. Yeah, I mean, what we're talking about here is a phenomenon that contravenes reason, but that fortunately is replicatable. Uh, you know, it's not like camping in cornfields waiting for flying saucers. If you camp in the cornfield and take six dried grams, uh, it will find you. Yes. So finally we found a causal relationship, uh, which indicates a new level of the dialogue. You see, always the dialogue before was they could fax you in the form of lights in the sky, messiahs, miracles, but you couldn't fax them. Now, there is this peculiar zone that has opened up called the psychedelic zone, the psychic zone, the psychological zone. And of course, we're uncertain of the status of what goes on there ontologically. So you're perfectly free to believe it was just a hallucination. Or you're perfectly free to believe, you know, that it was uh, an ambassadorial contact uh, with an alien mind. Yeah. Um, getting back to a couple of things and linking them together, uh, you talk about well, I've got a, uh, the afterworld or the shaman's idea that it comes from a society of souls. And this is one of the possible explanations for what this contact is. And then talking about the soul as the ultimate tool. Uh, another thing that, um, another idea that is, goes around in mystical circles is that, and even actually Carl talks about this, Carl's Castaneda, is that uh, one of the most important things we can do while we're alive is develop a soul and strengthen a soul, and that this is our tool in the afterlife, and that uh, and, and that all this, this atmosphere is for is that because we can't actually strengthen our soul on the other side because there's no friction, there's no positive and negative. So this is the place where we can actually develop an internal, inner, shining body that is that is separate from this body, but that this body is used as a tool to create that one. So that's one thing I wanted to put out there. And um, as a possibility, I don't know. Well, this would be probably a good moment to return to the gentleman's question about hypercarbolation. Uh, yeah, I mean, it isn't only Castaneda. It's a persistent idea worldwide at a certain strata that what life is for is the building and stabilizing and perfecting of, a, of an after-death vehicle of some sort, uh, a light body. Huh? Well, uh, hypercarbolation in the book I wrote called True Hallucinations, my brother proposed to uh, essentially treat all this metaphysical baffle garb as actually engineering, uh, you know, the, the material for an engineering project. And he set out to uh, emanatize the soul to actually force it to physically appear in nearby physical space as a kind of little spinning disc-shaped object which would follow you around. It would sort of be like a halo. Uh, we would enter into a world where there were two kinds of people, those who had gotten their after-death vehicle outside their body and into visible form, and those who were still working on it. And he, the idea being that this is a union of spirit and matter through the intercession of 
higher dimensional space. I mean, there's a lot of intellectual and linguistic side of hand here. Nobody knows what he's talking about. The f- problem is that out of such theorizing came tangible consequences. And I still think that really what, we're, what we need to do now is become actually conscious of the possibility of a techno of a technological, I guess that's the word for it, undertaking to uh, give birth to the collective soul of the species. I mean, the flying saucer, which Jung made this very clear, the flying saucer, which haunts our collective imagination, is a totality symbol that is in the unconscious, but it is moving toward conscious appearance and its peculiar mercurial interfacing with the observer indicates that it is something on the borderline between the conscious and the unconscious mind. But that's a temporal, um, mm, a temporary situation and conceivably this thing is moving toward us and it, it vibrates with the alien but it is in fact ourselves. And there is a kind of recurso here where the thing we lost at the descent from Eden is is actually, you know, on a collision course coming back again. This is the idea of the archaic revival that that we can really deconstruct reality in a fairly radical way. This is not my idea, by the way. I mean, this is what alchemy turned into. And in the 16th century, people like Gerhard Dorn and Robert Flood and John Dee and Michael Sendivorgius and all of these people were on the trail of what they called the lapis or the philosopher's stone. And it was a place where the normal either-or algebra of reality gave way to some kind of Boolean both-and exception. And strangely enough, that strategy of mixed algebras now characterizes how quantum physics describes uh, the base energy field of existence. Paradox cannot be eliminated from your model without sinking the model because it becomes trivial. Yeah. Um, we're kind of talking about the... Um the end of history, and I've listened to your tapes on the time wave, and you're writing on that. And the thing that occurs to me that the uh, this point that you're talking about, like the dwell point, uh, could be like the birth of a new kingdom of of life, like there's you've got like the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom, and fungi is kind of thought of as a separate kingdom. But software is is potentially a new kingdom. Of, of life that's really coming, it's coming out of the animal kingdom. Uh, uh, it's like going to be an expression of um, human creativity and imagination. So that could be either part of that whole transition part, or, or maybe the thing that makes, that really kind of sort of blows people's minds apart when they realize that, that we've like brought, we've birthed this new life force uh, into, the, into the universe. Well, yes, I mean, we, we, it, it's not clear that it will be overt and manageable and that there it will be in the laboratory. It's that it's happening all around us. It's that we are, we are embedding ourselves in a matrix of silicon and glass. We are actually in the same way that free swimming eukaryotic bacteria turned themselves into mitochondria and powered the cell by embedding themselves in primitive gels, we are beginning to embed ourselves into a a cultural membrane of some sort. And, And we are essentially the genetically driven components of an organometallic, self perpetuating matrix that is, uh, on the epigenetic level, redesigning itself all the time. It was McLuhan who said, human beings have become the genitals of machines. We exist only to improve next year's model. (laughs) 
and that, and that is a kind of evolution you see. I mean, the machines uh, read it, they don't change their physical form every million years. They change their physical form every eighteen months because human engineers are doing this. Nine million computers a month are being uh, linked into the global network. There's one theory of brain function that says that the higher order functions of the brain are simply emergent properties that come out of a network that has nine billion plus switching uh, potentials in it. While our global network is quickly approaching this critical number. So what is happening is a globalizing of intelligence. New as this sounds, you know, these kinds of ideas have been around for a while. If you haven't read Teilhard de Chardin, who you know, my God, S.J., right? And he talks about an omega point and what he calls the noosphere, the atmosphere of, of electronic mind that is emerging as a shell and closing the planet. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm sort of backtracking from your list of possible explanations. Uh-huh, fine. Um, and this one doesn't... I'd like to hear your... Feedback, and it doesn't really sit real well with me. It's sort of cynical, a little bit materialist. But I mean, um, who's to say that the psychedelic experience or is not just really a, a, a brain experience, a experience that really is not transcendent, but yet we are so used to a, a very limited way in which we experience re reality and use such a small section of our brain, supposedly, that it just seems uh, outwardly foreign that we externalize it. I mean, I, I'm no, it could... Mind, it, but just to, to add to the list, and what do you say to that? Uh, well, what I think the, the major evidence against that view uh, is the amount of the sheer complexity and amount of information that seems to be in there. Uh, if evolution works with some kind of economy, and that species that work without economy are eliminated, then what in the world would have been the evolutionary raison d'etre of preserving this visionary function for 500 million years of evolution until you reach the human species? It, it seems to lack functional and engineering integrity as an approach. Uh, the people, the reductionists who want to say, you know, that these drugs just perturb the brain, I don't think have taken enough of these things. It is not a, it is not a, a mishmash that you get. What you get is order, often a more ordered and symmetrical and uh, and self-satisfying world than the one we're living in. Uh, and, and in, in as far as the the mystical and metaphysical people are concerned, they're always saying there's no difference between the inside and the outside until you suggest they take psychedelic drugs. Then they start raving about the, necess the necessary purity that has to be maintained uh, and how there must be no artificial means. Well, which is it? That there's no inside and no outside? Or that these anxiety-riddled boundaries have to be maintained at all costs? The problem is, you know, meaning. And the meaning of meaning. Wasn't it F.H. Bradley who wrote a book of that title, I think? Uh, uh, what is meaning? And then what does it mean that there is meaning? Is it simply, as Whitehead suggests, the apperception of pattern as such? Or is there uh, eventually some kind of a, of a metaphysic, some kind of a, a discernible pa uh, mega pattern in all of this? My thing is basically to raise questions and to destroy cultural, culturally contrived answers because I think they're all horseshit. Uh, it, ha it hasn't worked. We do not know where we are in the game. We do not, we're not able to recognize the players. Uh, we've forgotten what our waitress looks like. And the <laughs> whole thing is just we're way at sea in this situation.
and uh, and and what culture seems to do is some kind of strategy for calming everybody down, mm-hmm. cooking up some parcel of lies, which then everybody works with that and doesn't notice the peculiarity of it all. This is why I think psychedelics are so controversial, because they break down cultural explanations, whatever they are. And I found even with rainforest shamans that uh, they they are very aware of how far they want to go, and and you know it's a rare personality that enjoys kicking all the supports out and just see watching it all collapse into the big who knows. But it's very edifying because it's honest. I think. Isn't that a logical threat to those who? Uh, have a vested interest in maintaining those illusions? Well, but what's happening, you see, is who has a vested interest in maintaining these illusions? People who want to die? Is that it? The, it at one point, defense of the status quo made sense. Now, the, the straightest people in the world are beginning to quake in their boots. And the people who, quote-unquote, run the world... They've got better information than you and I, and it, they they have they leave their offices white faced at night because they see you know that capitalism is finished because capitalism depends on an endlessly exploitable resource base to function. They have no idea what you put in place of a of a of a market driven capitalist economy. The population thing is under control. It is out of control. To get it under control, you would have to take on uh, the people who've run Western civilization for 1,700 years, i.e. the Roman Catholic Church. Who wants to dig into that mess? The ozone depletion of the atmosphere may have already passed criticality. That, that may be a death sentence waiting to be served and so forth and so on. So I don't think there is uh, anybody... I I think what we're seeing is spreading panic in the control centers of Western civilization and that very soon you can have a real discussion. Essentially, the Clinton thing is is just a gesture in that direction. But eventually... We're going to have to have a discussion about, you know, who gets to go to the lifeboats and who doesn't and stuff like that. And it's all going to be very dicey, I think. Actually, could you like just talk a little bit about how society then would be informed by psychedelics and, and what, what direction it might take and how our present society could utilize this in a way um, that would be productive and not just... Uh, the perpetuation of this whole sort of, you know, Nancy Reagan escapist philosophy, just and no type of thing. Well, our our problem is that we are in denial of our circumstance. If we could actually feel the situation, everybody would immediately walk to the parking lot, mm-hmm. get in their car, and go out and slave to stop the agony. But we don't feel it. I mean, we see the pictures from Bosnia. We see the pictures from Somalia. We feel it to some degree. We send money. But we don't stop consuming furiously. We don't reconstruct our lives. Taking psychedelics, I think, because its primary function is to dissolve boundaries, it dissolves the boundary between you and the pain or the problem, and then you have to do something about it. Who, who do you propose in this society is going to distribute this stuff? I mean, I, I'd, like that, I'd like to see that happen, perhaps, I really would. But is it going to be the psychiatrist, psychologist, is it going to be the church? No. I mean, or is it just simply going to be able to buy it over the counter? I, I, I see that as a problem. I'd like to see what you're proposing to occur. Well, I think it should be self-organized. The way to do it is to make it legal. You know, you, the spores are legal. They contain no psilocybin. There should be something called the Vegetable Drug Act, which simply states no plant is illegal. 
<laughs> Period. <laughs> Just that's it. And uh, and it would all sort itself out. And the, and the junkie could have his little opium garden and. I don't know if cokeheads could get it together enough to fill their backyard with coke. It would all sort out very, very nicely. And it's preposterous. I mean, you know, you read that in the Middle Ages, that in 1432 in Amsterdam, a pig was hung for murder. And then you, well, that's the kind of thing we've got going with the concept of an illegal plant. I mean, from any future enlightened point of view, they would just look back at that and say, how quaint, you know, <laughs> what a bizarre notion of reality. Yeah. I, I liked your idea. <laughs> you talked about how the legalization of these substances um, is non, I mean, it doesn't fit with our cultural context and it made me think a lot about legalization and made me think about um, making it really okay in my mind to define a law and to define impose morality in that regard. And that I don't I don't know if I think that it, it's possible for it to be legal. I really without a without a uh, without a battle or without a major uh, shift in the way things work. I, I, it just seems like it's something that I need to take upon myself and say Well I think the the hope law, but it's a higher law than the one that's imposed upon. The hope comes from Europe. I think America will just be shamed into legalization because in Europe, you know, the drug laws are very loose and Europe is a truly secular society. I mean, they just don't have rattlesnake handling Christers and Branch Davidians and all. They cannot figure this stuff out. You know? <laughs> I mean, I had a German friend visit me in Hawaii last summer and I... I took her to the beach and she immediately whipped her top off. And then I had to explain that you couldn't do that in America. And she'd said she'd heard you couldn't do that in America, but she couldn't believe that it was actually true. And, I, and then when I was looking at her, thought what it would take to make it possible to take your top off at a public beach in America, you just realize this is a society of lost souls. I mean, this is a society of the screwballs that couldn't handle the secularization of Europe and came here to practice what they called religious freedom, which basically meant crypto-fascism <laughs> on everybody else, you know. Uh, yeah, I agree. Look, uh, uh, black people didn't break loose till they got their backs up. Gay people would have been forever marginalized. They're not handing rights out in this society. <laughs> you, you have to take it. And uh, this, the drug thing has just been a polite conversation for far too long, I think. It's getting a little louder, but all, but uh, weasel arguments are being used. I mean, the reason cannabis is moving toward legalization is because an appeal is being made to the darkest impulses of capitalism. You know, you could make so much money off this. What do you care that it's a drug? You know? <laughs> um, what about the side of the rights, though, and that's the responsibility? I sometimes wonder, you know, as much as we like to complain about law and, and, and structure. It seems like we also rely on that to provide certain social structures around how something would be. We don't often claim the responsibility. How, how do you see, let's say, if um, drugs were legalized, how would we self-manage uh, in a responsible way to um, make that occur? Well, I maintain that since alcohol and tobacco are legal, we have already proven that we can absorb the social consequences of legalizing any drug. I mean, if you can tolerate the costs and what alcohol and all that does to insurance, then heroin is going to pose no problem. The, what, the problem with the law is that when the law becomes irrational, the law loses its moral force. And so it has to be reformed. And uh, this is, I believe, very difficult in this drug area because nobody's being straight about what's at issue. 
the real issue, like let's take cannabis, which is, you know, most people, whether they smoke cannabis or not, have the impression, I think, that this is a generally benign and over-discussed peril. Uh, and yet, I don't... I cannot imagine America legalizing cannabis simply because its psychological consequences are that it erodes loyalty to uh, the work ethic. You know, if people are not interested in screwing widgets on wonkles if they smoke and contrast it uh, to caffeine. Now, caffeine is a dangerous drug, does liver damage, is uh, known to be implicated in a number of pathologies. Uh, and yet, every contract, every labor contract signed in the Western world enshrines the right of laborers twice a day to stop the assembly line and tank up on coffee. <laughs> this is an extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary folk way. And why? Because caffeine is a made-to-order drug for the purposes of slave capitalism. I mean, you just scurry right back to your keyboard or your assembly line, and you can do the 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. shift then without, you know, falling on your face like a normal primate would <laughs> if they weren't jacked up on some alkaloid. And so that's very welcome. Uh, you know, it was McLuhan who made the point, and it still hasn't been assimilated by enough people, that uh, he said uh, that technologies carry a hidden agenda and shape their user in ways that the user is never conscious of. And in the great case that McLuhan made was print, which he said the linear and uniform nature of print created the preconditioned mindset able to accept democracy, the assembly line, the concept of the citizen. A whole bunch of modern ideas are uh, uh, presuppose print well, drugs are technologies, and they shape the users in ways that the users never suspect. And uh, our frenzied, goal-oriented, surface-obsessed society is a society of sugar, alcohol, red meat, and television. You know, I mean, television is an incredibly invasive and powerful drug. Uh, the average American watches six hours a day. Imagine if, following World War II, a drug had been introduced that now the average American spent six hours a day absolutely loaded on this drug, <laughs> doing nothing else. Uh, but because we are materialists, we don't see television as a drug, and yet... You know, your blood pools in your rear end, your brain waves fall into a measurable zone, you fixate. There is an entire set of symptoms no less dramatic than the symptoms of smoking a bomber or honking up a line. So, but we don't see television uh, that way. And the horror of television is you don't even get to have your own trip. You have somebody else's trip, <laughs> sponsored by the cosmetically enhanced surfaces of products. I mean, talk about a hell drug, my God. Yeah. So since there's an extreme minority of people who are using psychedelics right now on the planet, do you see this little minute portion scattered around really having an effect which will cause some sort of chain reaction before it's too late? To, uh, to really work some change? Or is it more like small colonies in the same? Kind of? Well, see, the plan, see, if it were business as usual, these psychedelic communities might not amount to anything. But I think that the world is going to get so <coughs> peculiar as the chickens come home to roost that you'll have to take psychedelic drugs to understand what's going on and that the people who don't will be running around like chickens with their heads cut off. 
because we haven't come, you know, people yak about the apocalypse, but this is not the apocalypse. This is the garden party before the apocalypse. I mean, w once it really hits, it's going to require a great deal of faith to believe that we're going to make it through it. And, uh, and I think that more and more organizations, governments, governing institutions are going to turn to the fringes for answers. Because what our circumstance is, is that history fails, orthodoxy failed, science failed, capitalism failed, reason failed. And we can't keep practicing these things because they failed. The ship is sinking. We can't have a debate about when we'll arrive in Bermuda. We're never going to arrive in Bermuda. The boat is now sinking. Mm -hmm. So the agenda has to change. And also, these people are dying off. You know, the old control freaks, the people who have one foot in the 19th century. Uh, as to your question of whether or not it will happen fast enough, well, that's the horse race we're involved in. That's the excitement, you know. It'll be a photo finish. H.G. Wells said, history is a race between education and catastrophe. Yeah, and the, and the other thing is Christianity took 300 years to become, you know, and it, and it started off with different sets of people that were nurturing the Christian idea. Unfortunately, the Roman Catholic sect one, but it could be the same thing. We could start these little sort of copy clutches of peyote takers that just... Well, and Christianity was able to do that in a world where information moved at the speed of a horse's gallop. So, you know, there's an enormous psychedelic religion flourishing in Brazil right now that just cannot convert people fast enough. It's missionarizing the United States. Shamanism. Uh, see, I think the reason I called my second book the archaic revival is because I think this is the overarching metaphor of the 20th century that the 19th century was the gentleman's century the white gentleman when it all worked commerce flourished cities were built the poor knew their place uh, brown people held their position and the 20th century has been all about confronting the, the bankruptcy of all of that. And from the time of surrealism and uh, Freud and Jung and Dada, <coughs> right through to rave music and jazz and rock and roll and abstract expressionism, these are all archaic impulses, you know? The, the 19th century is all about realism, materialism, and defined social structures. The 20th century deconstructs the visual image, deconstructs the idea of simple location. We have body piercing. We have uh, uh, trance dancing fire walking, all of these things are impulses to return to the primitive. And what it means is that in the aura of the realization that history has failed, we're going back to an earlier model. This is what societies do when they get in trouble. You know, we forget because we're the inheritors of it. But when medieval Christianity essentially got a flat tire by having... 70 popes in 25 years, none of whom died a natural death. That clued people to the idea that there was something wrong with Christian idealism. And the Renaissance capitalists, Italian city-state entrepreneurs, invented classicism. Classicism, meaning a, a society based on the ideals of Greece and Rome, was a science fiction option at that point. Greece and Rome had been buried in the ground for 1,500 years, and yet they dug it up. They dug up the buildings. They dug up the manuscripts. They dug it all up, and they said, this is how people should live. 
and we'll found classicism and we will be the patrons of the arts and we will undertake vast architectural undertakings and so forth and so on. And it worked. It set a model for society, Roman law, Greek aesthetics, clear into the middle of the 19th century when then the full consequences of the Industrial Reformation uh, created uh, you know, a kind of new serfdom of some sort. Now, uh, we require such a radical re, uh, a new paradigm that we have to reach outside the domain of history entirely. And the archaic then, which is a model of nomadism, of very little material culture, of uh, hedonism, a lot of focus on sexuality, sensuality, body adornment, this sort of thing, um, and an information-based culture ruled by magic. In the case of the archaic, it was natural magic. In our case, it will be the technological magic of electromagnetic uh, technology. You know, a global tribe. McLuhan was right. I mean, McLuhan is given zilch credit. He understood all of this stuff. He said all of this by 1965. The people who dismissed him never understood him. I'm quite convinced. Yeah. Well, what role do you think the, mud, the spores and the mushrooms will play in this global electronic network? Well, I think that part of what we're on the brink of is uh, a technological innovation, but I think also a rewiring of the human organism, and that uh, what psilocybin is about is it's a catalyst for language production and evolution, and that uh, the future evolution of language involves language being shifted into the visual domain. Notice how much of, how more visual reality is becoming, how icon-driven uh, the computer interface is and stuff like this. Uh, I think that psychedelics hold the way toward a kind of telepathy, not a telepathy of you hear my thoughts, but a telepathy of I see what you mean. This would erode boundaries tremendously. I mean, it's astonishing to think that our global civilization is linked together by nothing more than small mouth noises and the electronic transduction of same. I mean, small mouth noises are a very, very crude way to communicate the kind of complexity that our, our scene requires. The great thing about psychedelics is whether these personalities are realized or, or less than realized is that you don't need them. You know, the realized ones can be your friends. But the great thing about the psychedelic enterprise is that it's democratic and self-directed. And uh, uh, actually, my experience is that if you really take high doses, it's hard to be a rat. You have to have Im incredible defenses to be a real rat and take real high doses. And what it means is sooner or later it will ambush you in some tremendously unpleasant way and then you will get straight. Uh, I think it's tremendously exciting because it's a chance to take control of, one, of the project of, one, of defining one's own authenticity. And I don't really... The, the idea of the guide... It, or I'm glad that that concept has given way to the idea of the sitter because the sitter gets it much better. What the sitter is there to do is to keep you from rolling off the bed and to tell you that it's going to be all right, even though the sitter may have lost all confidence that it will ever <laughs> be all right. And they are guiding you nowhere because they haven't the faintest idea where you are. You know, they're just there to reassure. Uh, guided trips uh, are as often ambiguous, I think, uh, as, uh, as positive.
to the, you know, I know a guy who takes mushrooms fairly often, and he always says to me, he says, each time I take it, my goal is to stand more. And what he means is that there's no bottom to it, and it will reveal literally as much as you can tolerate. And, the, you know, you can get into a lock with it where you say, show me what you really are. Show me what you really are for yourself. And instantly, the cheerful scenarios of machine elves dancing mice and little candies spinning against black backgrounds, that's like suspended. And there's this organ tone, like from the Bach B minor mass, and these black velvet curtains begin to lift. And after about 15 seconds of that, you say, that's enough, thank you, of what you really are for yourself. Because you realize it is, it, it is willing to comply with the request, but your mind can't handle it. It is coming at you through a series of veils. It is trying to be reassuring. I mean, you're saying, my God, it's an alien from the heart of the galaxy. And what it's trying to pass as is your next door neighbor. Uh, because if it were ever to reveal the true dimensions of its alienness, you would probably vaporize in the presence of such peculiarity. Death by astonishment. We want to, we want to avoid that at all costs. Uh, yeah. Stories abound. I mean, stories upon stories. Amazing stories. And, and, and once you collect enough of them, in, you, you start collecting them thinking that there's going to be a pattern where you will learn something. Eventually you realize these stories are just designed to befuddle and lead you astray. I mean, you cannot tell what is going on. Uh, you said you're putting a book together with stories? You probably more than anything. Yeah, I've considered it uh, great trip stories. Uh, <laughs> Trading with the Aliens. Some of you may know a wonderful little story by Clifford Simak. I was talking to somebody about this recently. It was about a man who goes to a garage sale and he buys an oak roll-top desk. And, in, and he gets it home and he discovers that in one... He just notices, actually, that in one corner of this desk there's what looks like an ivory dot, an inlay of ivory. And he then... Uh, has this desk, and uh, after a couple of months, he he finds this thing on this dot, which he doesn't know what it is. It's just some little thing he doesn't can't figure it out, and uh, he discovers, to make a long story short, that if he will put something on this dot, it will be traded. And so he puts a paper clip and he gets a something or other. And then he puts a dime and he gets something else every 24 hours. And he begins trading through this alien trader. Uh, they, they, they are mean traders, these creatures from hyperspace. And the trick is to trade, is to get them to trade something that's very useful to you and valueless to them. Uh, I grew up in western Colorado, and up above nine or 10,000 feet in the old mining camps, uh, there are what are called pack rats. And, and what, a, what pack rats are about is they steal stuff. They steal little things, but they always leave something. They are trader rats. They don't actually steal. And there are many stories about people getting in league with a pack rat and trading seven-up bottle caps for gold nuggets that were hidden in the walls that because of these old mining towns, these rats have been stealing from the bar tills of a century ago. And, uh, and so this is a, you know, and the strange thing is when you trade with a pack rat, you have to discern its psychology because it may trade 7-Up bottle caps for gold nuggets, but if you switch to dimes, it will switch to dead bees, and they're no good to you. So you, you, you have to keep negotiating, you see, to get the good and to, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Exactly.
Although somebody pointed out to me, it was another one of these torpedoes, unexpected, that that print is visible language. That print is the condensation of sound. It's just that it requires a medium. Yeah. I was wondering, you know, in view of what you pointed out about some of the liabilities of, of asking to reveal what's deepest, darkest self, or its truest being, and I'm wondering if you could share some of your thoughts about setting an agenda for a trip and entering into a dialogue with this alien as opposed to perhaps being more passive and just la- allowing this emergence without any conscious direction to the extent that that's possible. I tend to be very passive. I sense immense power and potential in these states, and I'm frankly afraid of it. I mean, I like to watch. That's my bit. And I have no desire to seize the levers and start pulling and pushing buttons. I had a bit of a few... When I was younger, we messed around in more radical ways and had experiences that really, I felt like, threatened our sanity because you just couldn't believe what was going on. Uh... I don't set agendas. Some people do that. Uh, what I do do is I talk to it, and I, I ask it to, to show itself. And I do think you have to, you, you have to approach the thing. It, it is shy, or it's tasteful. It's hard to figure out which. But in any case, it will not speak to you unless spoken to. You can go through an eight-hour trip and it will never say a word because you never said a word. And you have to say to it, show yourself. It doesn't hurt to verbalize it. I mean, I think of it in my mind. I sort of, I, I, I invoke it, but it's also somewhat like a seduction. I mean, you say, come out, show yourself, be beautiful. And then this thing, literally almost like a turmoil in the air, and they condense, and they then they do show themselves. Uh, but unless invited, they won't do that. Now, in DMT, that isn't true. They're uninvited. I mean, you're in their domain. You're in Elfland Grand Central Station, and everybody's trying to get on the train to Westport. And you're just there, you know, in the middle of this crazy situation. Uh, yeah. What do you consider regular? I don't know. I think that's really a hard thing to say. I mean, I know people who say DMT is their favorite drug, and the last time they took it was '67. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, we're not talking abuse here. Uh, I think mo- psilocybin three or four times a year is definitely means that you are a psychedelic person, for sure. It definitely means that your every waking moment is informed and transformed by your relationship to this stuff. It doesn't take very much because it's a, it's a way of thinking, you know. Uh, I admire people who can do it a lot and not go off the deep end. Because what I find is, you know, basically what we talk about in these workshops is what I would call the generic psychedelic experience. You know, it lasts four to eight hours. There are all kinds of crazy hallucinations, insights, tears, laughter, self-affirmation. Then it goes away. That's the generic psychedelic trip. But if you start pushing, then you get to be Columbus. You know, if you, for instance, take psilocybin every 72 hours for 10 days, you will cure in the marketplace. You will preach to the masses. Uh, You will become so convinced of dogmas and points of view so peculiar that it will hand your friends a crisis. I mean, I've been there. And so it's the trick is to understand when you need to chill uh, because uh, it just starts opening ahead of you. Like when we would take it in the Amazon, 
uh, one of the things that we noted and talked about and was actually a moment of concern was in every psilocybin trip in the Amazon, there would come this, this moment where, where you would realize that the jungle was friendly and that that's where you belonged. And there was this impulse to just take your clothes off and walk into it. And with perfect confidence, I could survive. It would take care of me. It is not threatening. It is not unfriendly. It loves me. I don't know whether that's true. I don't know what would happen to you when you came down. I mean, there are stories of people not on psilocybin who walked into the jungle and, you know, were mad from fly bites 12 hours later and basically had to be shot like dogs in the best Colombian fashion. Uh, so... You know, this is an, so this is a very intense perception that you just don't know what to make of. Is it true? Could one somehow sustained by psychedelics walk into that and survive or, or not? Yeah. Uh, there's people I think that do that without psychedelics. Like some of these people that are acting the Aboriginal skills trips. They do that for reason. You mean white people who have, but they've trained themselves. They've hardened their bodies and they've learned how to make fire and how to get water from plants. And to do it just on the spur of the moment, I don't know how long you'd last out there. Yeah, sure. Would you say something to compare LSD and mushrooms like psilocybin? Well, psilocybin is much more visual. Uh, LSD is more psychoanalytical, therapeutic, personal in some way. Uh, it may be more uh, efficient at personality work, you know, reconstruction and overcoming trauma or phobia or something like that. Psilocybin is largely visual and uh, spectacularly so. That's what distinguishes the tryptamine hallucinogens is the ease with which they elicit really beautiful and complex hallucinations. I mean, people, uh, straight scientists who write about what they call hallucination are really writing about what is technically called hypnagogia, which means the trivial hallucinations on the edge of sleep, you know, the spinning wheels, the moving grids of color, the dancing mice, that sort of thing. Uh, Psychedelic hallucinations are visionary operas of some sort. I mean, they are tremendous. They're more visually dramatic than any film experience or experience in the real world that you could have. There's no very good explanation for what that's all about. In your trial and error of getting to five grams of mushrooms, um, did you, uh, have you... Have you got 10 grams and that was too much, or, is it, or have you built up to that and that's, that's enough? 10 grams is too much for me. I mean, I, people have different reactions to it. I think if it gets un, too, uh, if the episodes of un-Englishability are too prolonged, then you need to back the dose down, you know, because it just doesn't make any sense. It's also the power of it. I mean, my God, when you overdose on psilocybin, it's like an asteroid struck the planet or something. It's very hard to convince yourself that it's confined between your ears. It's more like, you know, everything from Las Vegas West just was vaporized. <laughs>